Yeah, so it was, as it's Mother's Day, you know, it's funny. I was in Fred Meyer last night, and the place was packed with dudes, you know? And, and like, the Mother's Day cards were all out. Only the lame ones were left, like cat cards, you know? It's like, nobody wants a Mother's Day cat card, um, you know? And um, so, I, you know, so brothers, if you need a card, you know, if you need to swing by, don't go to Fred Meyer on your way home, all right? I ended up just getting a blank one. Uh, because it doesn't really matter what's on the outside, right? It's what you write inside. Amen, ladies? Amen. (laughs) Well, we're so thankful for our moms here. We're thankful for you and the ways you've served us, the ways you've sacrificed for us, the ways you've blessed us. We're also thankful for the young ladies that serve in the back, that serve with our children and, and love on them. We recognize that many of you are mothering, even if you don't have biological children around, and we're thankful for you too. And we also know today isn't just a day of celebration, that many of you, as Brian mentioned, are are carrying pain today uh, for various reasons, right? Today is a day of sadness for many. Uh, You know, some of us have lost our mothers. Some of us uh, want to be mothers. Some of us want to be married. Some of us have lost children. Some of us are disconnected relationally from family. And the list goes on and on. And so today we celebrate mothers, but we also recognize that many of you are in a place of sadness. And some of you might be experiencing that simultaneously, some of those emotions. Um, And so I briefly wanted to ask uh, James to come on up and, and to pray for us, to pray a prayer of thankfulness and celebration for our mothers, but also prayers of of healing and comfort for those that are hurting today. Pray with me, would you? Father, we are very thankful today for our own personal mothers and all the mothers in this room. And and it is a, we give you thanks for a thankless job. And um, Lord, it's, it's, it's hard work and, but you've called those women to do that. And we thank you for that. The the hours of, of the cooking and the cleaning and, Lord, the prayers that have gone up for us. And so we thank you for that. And, Lord, we do recognize that there are a lot of people today that are hurting. Um, there are those of us that, like me, that have lost their mothers. And there are those women that um, they long to be mothers and, and they maybe don't understand why. Lord, may you grant comfort and peace on this day that can be so bittersweet. Lord, we just again thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, James. So it's always awkward to know where to go on Mother's Day, where to teach and, and what, to, what to do. Do you do a standalone teaching? Do you just continue through and not even talk about it? So we kind of chose a hybrid today. Uh, as you've seen, we're in season two of Genesis uh, entitled Legacy. And uh, so we're going to continue through, but it will have a Mother's Day flavor, I promise, ladies. Uh, they say that Mother's Day is like the third most attended Sunday in the year and that Father's Day is the worst attended Sunday of the year. So... <laughs> Bros, we're expecting you back on Father's Day. But uh, we've been in this series called Legacy, and we've seen in Genesis that God is working to reverse the curse of sin that started in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve plunged us into this downward spiral of sin and separation from God, and God decides to use one man, Abram, to bless the whole world. He's going to do something remarkable and spectacular through him. And so he picks Abram and he says, Abram, I'm making you a promise. I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you descendants. And you are going to bless the world. You're going to bless the entire world. And from a human perspective, we left off last week with the promise looking unlikely. Because uh, he can't have kids. His wife can't have kids. And so... um, there's a big issue. So today, we're going to skip over chapters 13 to 15 and go to chapter 16 to do a character study on both a mother and someone who wants to be one. And then uh, we'll go through those chapters in the following week. And in your notes, it's going to talk about two mothers. I don't think we're going to get to the second mother 
Uh, she's not a mother yet. We're, so we're, we're not going to talk about Sarai, so your notes will be slightly off. Um, so I guess the new title today is Two Wives, One Mother. Two Wives, One Mother. Uh-oh, I think, uh, me, is there another slide there, Joan? No? Oh, no worries. Okay, um, so we already feel this tension. Two wives, one mother. And, uh, you know, we're going to see some, some crazy fireworks here. Genesis 16.1. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. That's not a good idea. Perhaps I can have, a children, perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal. So Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So Abram had sexual relations with Hagar, and she became pregnant. So once again, this is a reminder that God is committed to working with messed up people. Right. Uh, this is um, crazy. God promises Abram kids, and he and Sarai can't have them. And so Sarai suggests a culturally acceptable custom, which just because it's culturally acceptable doesn't make it right, right? Right. Uh, and it's the, the, the practice of having kids through someone else. And so she attempts to attain a divine promise with a human solution. She attempts to attain a divine promise with a human solution. She thinks God is obviously stuck and in need of her creative assistance. And Abram's posture towards his wife resembles Adam's posture in the garden when his wife offers him the fruit. And so Abram marries Hagar, Sarai's Egyptian maidservant, and she may have been a gift from Pharaoh when they went down. Remember the story last week, Abram and his wife head down to Egypt. Abram's scared. He says, hey, pretend to be my sister, and uh, it'll be good, you know, an act of cowardice, and, uh, and just all this stuff happens. So from that bad decision, you know, Pharaoh gives them some servants, and one of them may have been Hagar. And uh, which, by the way, every time some people say, oh, the Bible, you know, it talks about polygamy. The Bible uh, supports these kind of old archaic practices. And every time the Bible mentions polygamy, uh, it's, it's displayed in a negative light. Right? These are not good things. These are not good situations. Things always go wrong. Pick up in uh, verse 4. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress, Sarai, with contempt. Then Sarai said to Abram, this is all your fault. I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. Abram replied, look, she's your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. Then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. So what's going on here? Sarai's solution, her human solution, uh, gives her temporary comfort but the pregnancy soon creates a bitter rivalry. You know, think about it. Sarai is the chief lady in charge. She's the boss. But social status in that culture came from having children. So all of a sudden, when Hagar marries Abram and then gets pregnant, she, you know, all of a sudden there's this power struggle. I mean, imagine it. One day, Sarai is barking out orders to Hagar, clean the camels, make dinner, you know, uh, wash the... You know, watch the house or something. Clean, clean, clean up. And it suddenly clicks to Hagar. I don't have to take this anymore. I'm the one with the child. I'm the one who's pregnant. I'm the future of this family. And so she thinks she can kind of climb the ladder. And so it just creates this bitter, bitter rivalry between the two women. And you can almost picture it too. Sarah, her whole life's wanted to be pregnant. And finally, Hagar is. I mean, imagine, Abraham, feel my belly, you know? Oh, yeah, isn't this awesome? Can you rub my back? I'm kind of sore. You know, you could just feel the tension and, and all this stuff going on. And so Sarah, I just can't take it anymore. And she goes to Abram in frustration. Man, what am I going to do? And, and he offers us, you know, he doesn't really offer a solution. He says, hey, she's your, she's your servant. Deal with her as you want. You handle it. So again, Abram takes the route of passivity. And so Sarai, in her anger and insecurity, treats Hagar so harshly that Hagar runs away. 
So if you're taking notes here, uh, Hagar and Sarai demonstrate three massive character flaws. First is jealousy. Jealousy. And I often mix up jealousy and envy. Um, I don't know about you. I, I kind of use the words interchangeably, but whatever. So let's just use the words together. Jealousy, envy. Hagar is jealous of Sarai's power. And Sarai is obviously jealous of Hagar's pregnancy. I love how James puts it in James 3, 13 through 18. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you're bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure. It's also peace-loving, gentle at all times, willing to yield to others. It's full of mercy and fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism. It's always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. So jealousy and envy come from a place of comparison. Comparison. Seeing what someone else has and feeling resentment because we don't have it. Social media only heightens this, right? For those of you that are on there on Instagram or Facebook or Pinterest, these things, these comparisons. Very similar to jealousy is selfish ambition, right? Selfish ambition is jealousy's ugly cousin. Both Sarai and Hagar are trying to promote themselves, trying to advance culturally and socially, to achieve greatness in the minds of those around them. I love what Paul says in Philippians 2, 3. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit or empty praise. Rather, in humility, value others as above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. It's really interesting to note that that word ambition uh, used to be exclusively a negative word. Uh, Older translations of the Bible would just use the word ambition. They didn't ever need to put selfish in front of it. It would be like redundant, like saying cold ice, you know, selfish, selfishness. Um, But the fact that modern translations now need to say selfish ambition just shows that our culture has turned a vice into a virtue. Really interesting. The theologian Ambrose, he called ambition a hidden plague. Yet today we see this idea of ambition to say someone's ambitious. That's a compliment. That's a, uh, you know, something to be uh, sought. Three, we see this idea of distrust and fear. Distrust and fear. There's so much distrust going on in this house. So much fear and watching each other's back and always kind of trying to look out for yourself. And so much so that the pregnant Hagar runs away. And, and so Hagar runs away, and all of a sudden she has this profound experience with God in the wilderness. It's pretty cool. Uh, pick up in verse 7. Genesis 16, verse 7. The angel of the Lord found Hagar behind a spring of water in the wilderness along the road to Sur. The angel said to her, Hagar, Sarai's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she replied. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, You are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, which means God hears, for the Lord has heard your cry of distress. This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all of his relatives. Therefore, Hagar uh, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. She also said, have I truly seen the one who sees me? So after after that well was named uh, Bir Halasharoi, which means well of the living one who sees me. It can still be found between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar gave Abram a son, and Abram named his name Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. So like I said, Hagar's running away. She has this profound experience with this angel, the angel of the Lord in the desert. 
and, and it deeply changes her. And so her character flaws are almost reversed, and we see uh, these three commendable qualities. First, we see humility. Humility. The angel tells her she needs to go back to Sarai and submit to her and to submit to her authority, to go back to the place of mistreatment and micromanagement without trying to grab power and prominence. Can you imagine how difficult this would have been to humble herself? Right? Honoring God is one thing, but honoring someone else, honoring someone you hate, that's entirely different. You see, some people think that honor or respect is earned. We'll hear things like, you know, I've lost all respect for him. Or, you know, she really earned my respect. The idea is that honor or respect has a price tag. And if someone doesn't pay up, if someone fails or falls, then they don't get it. See, Christianity has a radically different idea about honor. 1 Peter 2.17 says, honor everyone. Honor everyone. Ephesians 5.33, in talking about husbands and wives, it says, However, each of you, let each of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. In the same way that husbands are to unconditionally love their wives, wives are to unconditionally respect their husbands. And some of you might be thinking, man, that's crazy. There's some people out there that I could never honor, that I could never respect. Some people that, you know, I don't know, like my boss, my spouse, my teachers, my kid's soccer ref, you know? So some of you guys, man, the disrespect to refs is bad, you know? Uh, but, you know, on a serious note, we, we think that there's people, that these people don't deserve our respect. And so two thoughts about this common perspective. First uh, is that everyone's made in God's image. We talked about that back in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And so they deserve dignity from that fact alone. No matter who they are, from those on death row to Donald Trump, right? Everyone deserves just, they're, they're valuable by virtue of being human. But secondly, and perhaps more provocatively, I can honor those who I feel don't deserve it because Jesus honored me when I didn't deserve it. Right? I can respect those that don't deserve it because God respected me when I didn't deserve it. Man, do I deserve God's respect? Do I deserve God's honor? Do I deserve God's forgiveness and God's um, his grace? No, not at all. And you don't either. Yet God extends an unbelievable amount of grace and honor to us in his son, Jesus Christ, the greatest gift ever given. And when I realize how much God has honored a dishonorable man like me, then I'm able to extend that same honor to those who don't deserve it. Even and especially when they aren't worthy of it. So back to the story. Hagar is called to humility, to honor Sarah, even when she doesn't deserve it. But what fuels and motivates this is what comes next. And next we see hope. Hagar displays hope. While the road ahead will be incredibly difficult for Hagar, uh, the angel promises it'll be worth it. Look at verse 10. He tells her that she will have countless descendants. A great nation will come from her. In verse 11, the angel reveals the gender of the baby. It's pretty cool. No ultrasounds back then or anything like that. Uh, he says it's going to be a boy. And the angel actually gives her the name, you know, Hagar's not going to have to go through the baby scrolls and pick one, you know. The angel gives it to her. That's cool, you know. And uh, he says, your baby's name is going to be Ishmael. And so Hagar has all these things to look forward to, even when life gets hard. Paul in Romans 8.32 gives us a promise that's greater than Hagar's. He said this, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. God gave us his priceless son. God gave us himself in human form. That's like someone cutting us a check for a billion dollars. 
Right? It's something so valuable. I can't even get my head around that number, a billion. You know, I can't even imagine how much money that would be and how, what that would look like in ones. Right? And so stick with the metaphor here. If God gave you, if God gave us his billion-dollar son, what are 10 cent problems? Or even a hundred or one thousand dollar problems. They're nothing compared to the value of what's been given. Right? All our problems, though still painful and significant, pale in comparison to the great promises given to us. In three, we see Hagar's faith. We see her humility, hope, and her faith. Hagar recognizes two surprising truths about God that she hadn't realized before. First, the name Ishmael means God hears. God hears. Imagine every time she said Ishmael, 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 God hears. It's a reminder. Kind of cool back then how your name would mean something, you know. The second thing she realizes, she says this in verse 13, you are the God who sees me. You're the God who sees me. You're the God who hears me and the God who sees me. Does God feel distant to you? Do you feel far from God today? Do you feel like your prayers go unanswered? Like no one's listening to them? Like God's not hearing you? Like God's not seeing you? All throughout the Bible, we see people come to the realization that God does hear. That God does see. That you are valuable to him. That your pain is seen by him. And so the word I want to leave with us today as the worship team or maybe just Brian comes back up uh, is the word patience. The word patience. If you look at those three things, humility, faith, and or humility, hope, and faith. And I heard it said, and I'm not sure who said it, but it's this idea that humility is patience with others. Faith is patience towards God. And, and hope is is patience toward yourself. Humility is patience towards others. Faith is patience towards God. And hope is patience towards yourself. It's that, uh, that patience that, that comes from the fact that knowing that God sees, that he hears, and, and that he's there. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for our mothers and, and for what they've done, for who they are, for the, for the ways you've used them in our lives. God, thanks for the story of Hagar. And uh, even though, Lord, we make bad decisions, even though we've messed up and, and made a mess of things sometimes by doing things our own way, thanks for this reminder today, again, that even in plan B or C or D, Lord, you can uh, show yourself, you can uh, be present and active even in all of our bad decisions. Lord, we pray that um, those who are hurting today, those who are in need of redemption would... Uh, would seek you and find you and recognize that you are the God who hears. You're the God who sees. In Jesus' name, amen.